Welcome to Fireside Giants. My name is Alex and my co-host, Anthony Rivardo. Today, we're talking about Daniel Jones, of course, your favorite quarterback. I know a lot of you guys do not like Daniel Jones, but we're here to tell you we think that there is some potential left for him. He hasn't realized it yet. We haven't realized it yet. And we're going to talk about why we think 2021 could be his breakout season. Um, it's going to have a lot to do with the playmakers. But before we dive into it, my joke of the day, this is kind of a funny one, I think. Okay, so what is the difference between a Philadelphia Eagles fan and a carp? I don't know. What is it? One is a bottom-feeding scum sucker, and the other is a fish. 8 out of 10. Yes! Let's go! 8 out of 10. That's my best record. That's my best one so far. I think that's your best one. Yeah, that one was pretty good. That was a good one. I, I appreciate that. I yeah. appreciate the love. Good job, I dude. hope you guys I'm enjoyed so that one, too. A little... <laughs> thank you, sir. A little bit edgy. I know some people want a little bit more edge to them, so I gave a little bit more edge. You're welcome. Um... Oh, yeah. But I, I think that was a good Alex way to start the, the video. Work, dude. Alex yes. is so edgy. Yeah, I'm really edgy. I'm really getting with the trends. You, you, you know how I do. But for the most part, the edgiest part of this video is Daniel Jones being a breakout potential player in 2021. That's the real edge. It's and edgy. a lot of people are going to say in the comments, he should be gone. We should replace him. We should this. We should that. Let me just run a couple reasons why I don't think Daniel Jones has really had the opportunity to prove to us he is capable of being a franchise quarterback yet. And that is, there's two re there's two really main reasons. One of them, he has never had a, Sa a healthy Saquon Barkley during his tenure, two years, right? So never had a healthy Saquon Barkley. His receivers have been absolute garbage for the most part, aside from Sterling Shepard. Everybody else, you know, Darius Slayton was great in, in his first year, but then he took a major drop off this past season. He had two new play callers, right? Two entirely different schemes, entirely different chemistry, uh, new offensive linemen this past year. How are we going to sit here and say this is all Daniel Jones's fault? You know, there are some things that I'm not going to let him get away with all the stuff that he did wrong. You know, when it comes to the fumbles, uh, the interceptions, the making bad decisions, the not being able to move on from his first progression. Um, there's a lot of things here that we can blame Daniel Jones for, but there's a lot that we should say, okay, you know what? Th there's a lot he wasn't given to work with, you know, in terms of different schemes, different players. I, I don't really um, think that it's fair to, to place the majority of the blame on him just yet. I think that we need to see him with better weapons and a better team around him to really uh, exercise his potential, Anthony. Now, do you agree with that? Do you think that, you know, how much of the blame lands on him over the past two seasons? What are his major weaknesses? You know, what are the things that he needs to alleviate before we can say, you know, I think he is going to be the future? Yeah, I mean, Daniel Jones isn't blameless. He's not a perfect player, of course not. Otherwise, we wouldn't really even be having a discussion about his breakout season, right? You know, like, um, obviously the turnovers have been a big problem for Daniel Jones throughout his first two seasons. I think he really made a lot of improvements there in that regard in season two, you know, 2020. Um, he turned the ball over a lot less. He fumbled the ball a lot less. I didn't think um, he threw that many interceptions. I think a lot of them came off of the hands of Evan Engram and other players and bad at the line of scrimmage, stuff like that. So, you know, overall, I think that he did a pretty solid job, all things considered, keeping the ball out of harm's way in year two, especially when you compare it to year one. We saw, I feel like we saw a huge jump and a huge improvement in that category. Um, so, you know, but he isn't blameless. You know, he hasn't been perfect. His decision-making at times can be pretty bad. His pocket presence is still, like, needs some work. We saw a lot of improvements in that regard, especially towards the end of the season. You know, we could see it against Baltimore especially. Um, but it still needs to improve. Everything needs to improve, you know. Uh, even his accuracy could be a little more consistent. You think about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers game. We should have won that game. We win that game. We're in the playoffs, you know, looking back at it. His accuracy was terrible that night. I don't know if it was the wind or what, but it was really, really bad. And, you know, had it been a little bit better, he hit a couple of those deep shots, the Giants win that game, and maybe we're still talking about the Giants season right now, you never know, maybe we would have beaten Tampa a second time when we got to the playoffs, you know, so I digress anyway, um, but in terms of the playmakers around him, like you mentioned, yeah, I mean, having Saquon Barkley back would be huge for him, you know, like he hasn't really gotten to play with Saquon much, the only time he did was really like a healthy Saquon was really towards the end of the 2019 season his rookie season he got to play with Saquon they went off they both went off against Washington on the road 
Jones had five touchdowns. I think Saquon accounted for at least one of them, maybe two. I don't remember, actually. But I know he ran for a ton of yardage and even had, like, a lot of receiving yards in that game. I think he had, like, 90 receiving yards and 150 rushing yards, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I have the stats um, right here. I have the stats right here. I'll tell you right now. Go ahead. Yeah, pull them the out. Last, the last three weeks of the 2019 season, that was when Saquon really gained his health back. He looked a lot more normal um, and looked like he was gaining back some of his steam. The last three weeks, you know, against Miami in week 11, oh, sorry, week, let's see, 15, he had 112 yards and two touchdowns, okay? A pretty damn good stat line there. Then you go to Washington in week uh, 16, and he had 189 yards and a touchdown, and he had a receiving touchdown, right? So he has two touchdowns there, uh, one catching and one running. And then week uh, 17 against Philadelphia, he has 17 carries, he has 92 yards, and he has a rushing touchdown. So over the last three weeks of the season— the guy had over 300 yards rushing. Yeah, way over 300 yards rushing. He had one, two, three, four, five, uh, five touchdowns. So, I mean, you tell me. It looks like when he was healthy, their their offense was churning. Yeah, I mean, we know Saquon Barkley is a monster when he's healthy. And another thing that I'll say to that, which will kind of segue us into, um, you know, reason two as to why Saquon Barkley might break out. In his rookie season, you know, that was obviously Daniel Jones' best, or I mean, sorry, Saquon Barkley's best season, 2018. He was incredibly led the NFL in yards from scrimmage. He was absolutely dominating every week. His first touchdown run was a 68-yard run against the Jaguars in week one. Like, from the get-go, the guy was amazing. Even to this day, that 68-yarder, that was his first touchdown run, is probably arguably, it's arguably his best touchdown run of his career so far. But one thing that the Giants had in 2018 that they haven't had since then is a number one wide receiver. They had Odell Beckham Jr., and that really opened things up in the running game for Saquon Barkley. And that allowed him to have many opportunities to run against, you know, less stacked up boxes, less of a run defense and more of a pass coverage defense, you know, and allowed him, you know, one play that I'll think of that really uh, fits that point, right? Um, Against Chicago Bears, Saquon Barkley makes like a 25-yard run on third and 28 or something, right? Right before halftime, Aldrick Rosas goes on to hit a 57-yard field goal because Saquon on third and 20-something picks up all but one yard. They get the first down on fourth and one or two yards, and then Rosas hits a 57-yarder. That play was possible because um, Chicago went out in a pass defense. And then the Giants ran the ball at Saquon. So it was just a ton of defensive backs and people who were dropping back into coverage. He makes all of them miss, gains a 10 yardage, gets out of bounds. And that play was sick, and it's a play that nobody should ever be able to make. But it was also a play where the defense was accounting for the pass and accounting for this ball being thrown to Odell Beckham Jr., you know, he was the playmaker for the Giants offense for all those years, and especially still in 2018, in terms of the passing game, they knew the ball is going to Odell if they need to pick up a lot of yardage, right? So that was a change that uh, began once Saquon got here, got here, he was able to pick some yards up in the running game against defenses like that. But over the past two seasons, he's been asked to do a whole lot more without Odell Beckham Jr. on the roster. He's been asked to carry the offense. That's what Saquon Barkley's had to do. And honestly, you could say that that's kind of the reason he's had some injuries. He's been doing a lot. He's been doing maybe too much at times. You know, fighting for extra yardage when he doesn't necessarily need to. Putting his body in harm's way and getting injured. You could make that argument. And I think that this offseason, the Giants are going to find the number one wide receiver, whether that's through free agency or the draft, whether that's Allen Robinson, Kenny Galladay, Devontae Smith, Jalen Waddle, they're going to get a new wide receiver who's hopefully going to be a number one wide receiver that can catch, you know, 10 passes in a game for 150 yards and two touchdowns if he absolutely has to. So once they get that back in the lineup, a player, not, maybe not even to Odell's caliber, Odell, you know, he was a monster for a while. But maybe not to that caliber, but just a guy, a number one receiver who can actually catch for over a thousand yards in a season. Once we get that, pair that with Saquon, that's when Daniel Jones is just going to start playing better because either he's handing it off to a guy who's picking up six yards per carry or he's throwing the ball to a guy who's getting 15 yards per reception. The offense will really open up. Saquon Barkley will have a much better season once he has a number one wide receiver and just the whole offense in general will start to click and start to put up a lot more points. Absolutely. I mean, that's that's the goal is to get Saquon back and really 
force defenses to allocate energy and players um, and man coverage and whatnot to stop Saquon because it takes guys out of coverage. It takes defensive backs and out of coverage and allows those wide receivers to dominate and man. Um, but I do want to give some statistics just to, to finalize this point and why um, it's so important for Daniel Jones to have Saquon back. And it really dates back to 2018 and Saquon's rookie year. So in his rookie season, the Giants averaged 103.1 yards per game on the ground, right? The craziest part about it is they had one of the worst offensive lines in the NFL. And it showed you that Saquon really carried that offense on his back. You know, he really was picking up so much yardage. I mean, aside from OBJ there as well, um, he just was able to churn, on, churn up yardage over and over and over again. Um, and help this offense, you know, just motor along pretty pretty efficiently. But the the thing is, you you uh, go to 2020, and the Giants with Alfred Morris and Wayne Gallman have 110.5 yards per game. And I think that is a bigger testament to the offensive line's improvement in run blocking than it is the running back position um, for the Giants. I think I do think Wayne Gallman played exceptionally well, and I think his north south style was was actually very effective for the Giants this year. But it was a lot because they were opening up major gaps for him to run through. And, you know, he took advantage of that. They exploited that. Nobody expected Alfred Morris to do as well as he did um, on this team. You know, he he was he looked slow as molasses out there. So I was pretty impressed with him um, and his ability to get some good yardage, be patient, and, and find those gaps. You have a guy like Saquon who managed to average 103 yards two years ago with one of the worst offensive lines in the league, blocking and pass blocking. Um... It's gonna be it's gonna be fun to watch Saquon with some open lanes and what he can do because guys like Wayne Gallman, guys like Alfred Morris, they, like they are they aren't capable of making guys miss in the open field. You know, Wayne Gallman isn't a guy that's gonna make someone miss in the open field. He's a guy that's gonna run through somebody and and not get tackled. You know, Saquon Barkley can do both. He can not really can he run through people, but he's one of the most agile and, and quick twitch running backs in the NFL. He can make those guys miss on the blink of an, of an eye. You know, he's gone. He can leap over people. We've seen it um, against Danny Trevathan and the Chicago Bears a couple years ago. We saw him literally jump over somebody. So the athleticism he has compared to Gallman and Alfred Morris, they don't even have that combined. So when you add him to this to this offense with a a very good run blocking offensive line. It's going to be special. And how does that help Daniel Jones? That is the entire point of this video. It takes guys out of coverage because it forces opposing defenses to stack the box, play more cover one, um, you know, just pay more run blocking schematics because they have to they have to hold down OBJ, or rather, sorry, Saquon. And then you have a wide receiver one. You have a guy like OBJ. Maybe it's Jalen Waddle. Maybe it's Kyle Pitts. Maybe it's Allen Robinson who can beat man coverage. That's the major point: beating man coverage. Okay, the Giants were one of the worst teams in the NFL in 2020 um, when it came to wide receiver separation. You know, that was a huge problem. And Anthony, you know, how important is uh, yards of separation? And why do you think it's going to help Daniel Jones to get a wide receiver one so much with Saquon demanding so much attention uh, from the backfield? Yeah, when you are evaluating the wide receiver position, right? Um, this is something where, you know, if you do read up like a lot with the draft network or pro football focus, the number one thing that they harp on in terms of evaluating wide receiver talent coming out of college, separation is king. The guys who get open, who can run the routes properly and get wide open, just create separation, those are the guys who translate, their talents translate to the NFL. Guys like J.J. Arthago whiteside for Philadelphia, not just to throw the shade at Philadelphia, but he was really good in college, but that's because he was just catching 50-50 balls all the time, and he was really good at that. It hasn't translated to the NFL, and it probably never will. And the other guy who ended up with Philadelphia eventually, I think his name was Hakeem Butler, I think out of Arizona, same thing. He was one of those guys who just goes up there catches 50-50, catches 50-50 balls. The guys who separate, the guys who run the routes, get wide open, those are the guys who are going to succeed at the next level. So separation, to speak it to that point, is extremely important. And the Giants need more guys that can separate. The reason it's so important is because the cornerbacks in the NFL are so much more physical, so much faster, and so much stronger, and just better than they are in college. They will stick to you like glue if you don't know how to run your routes properly and separate. So you can shut wide receivers down completely with an NFL quarter, uh, cornerback, but if you have a good receiver who can run the routes and separate, You'll have some open open receivers to throw to. Daniel Jones really hasn't had that. He's been throwing into tight, you know, tight windows every game, every throw almost. He's always throwing into these tight windows, and that's why you know a lot of those passes, even if they get through the window and they hit the receiver, sometimes they bang right off the receiver's hands because the receiver gets hit just as soon as the ball gets there and it falls incomplete or maybe pops up and becomes an interception. The Giants need more open windows. They need more large 
windows to throw the ball into just to you know Jones doesn't have to be as accurate when he's throwing to a super large window and he's accurate enough to get it into some tight windows but others you know what's wrong with having open windows to throw to Jones just doesn't really usually have those and we really need him to have those that's why everybody says we need that number one wide receiver for him it's absolutely true because he can't just keep throwing it into tight coverage it's not sustainable wide receivers on the Giants aren't separating and they absolutely need to when they do though like Sterling Shepard against the Ravens when he ran that whip route on the goal line he runs it in fakes the slant bangs it outside gains like three four yards of separation easy throw for Daniel Jones instant touchdown we need more plays like that more receivers who can actually separate you know right now I feel like Sterling Shepard's really the only one that can separate on his routes and the rest of them have to hopefully make a 50-50 catch like Golden Tate I think Let's, if we go and look back at Golden Tate's catches this season, I bet you nearly every single one of them is some ridiculous 50-50 ball that he snagged and plucked out of air with a guy draped all over him. That's Golden Tate now. That's just who he is, right? And the Giants just frankly need more guys who just get wide open. You know, you look at the Chiefs offense and stuff like that, you know, and that's very extremist to look at the Chiefs because, you know, Andy Reid schemes people wide open a lot of the times. But still, if you look at Tyreek Hill, you look at all those best receivers in the NFL, DeAndre Hopkins, that's another really good one. You have receivers running wide open and you're like, how the hell do you let DeAndre Hopkins get that wide open? It's like, well, you don't allow it. He just makes it happen, dude. And that he's just a route runner. And, you know, Tyreek Hill is the same thing. He's so fast and he's a good route runner and he can even catch it over people if he needs to. Like, we need one of those receivers that's a complete package, but more importantly than anything, a wide receiver that can run some routes, separate, get open, make this job much easier for Daniel Jones, and then we'll start to see him flourish. And one last point, Stefan Diggs. That is the main thing that you look at, right? Josh Allen, in year two of his career, his accuracy was atrocious, and a lot of people were ready to just say, we'll give him one more year, but if he doesn't turn around, he's done. Josh Allen's arguably an MVP candidate this year. He has a really solid chance of making it to the Super Bowl. He's one game away from getting there. And if he gets there, there's a really good chance that he wins it. Ever since I got Stephon Diggs, he's been a completely new player. He's had a wide open number one wide receiver to throw to. That dude's separate. I mean, Stephon Diggs is like top three route runner in the NFL, you know, and he's getting wide open because of that. And Josh Allen doesn't have to be as accurate as most other quarterbacks. He can throw some inaccurate passes. Granted, he's been a lot more accurate this year, and that's why he's been so good, but he has the ability of having some of those throws like he had last year where he's not that accurate and they're difficult catches, but the receiver is just wide open, so it doesn't matter. And that's the Stephon Diggs effect. That's the number one wide receiver effect. Get a guy that can separate, run good routes, get open, watch your quarterback start to, to thrive in this offense. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's spot on. That really leads us to our second point, and the second point is adding playmakers for Daniel Jones to utilize, you know, because... At the end of the day, let's let's list off what he had to work with uh, this year. You know, Sterling Shepard, which is his, his number one guy, right? That's his number one receiver, who is really a, a great complement to a number one. He's a number two. Um, and he was matching up against number one corners all year long. That's why we didn't see him, you know, really excel that much. Plus, Jason Garrett, it took him freaking 16 weeks to figure out to use him in the red zone. And he, and he tripled his freaking touchdown production um, in those last two weeks of the season. So it took a while for Jason Garrett to figure that one out. Um, then you have, you know, let's say Darius Slayton who had a down year. Maybe he was dealing with injuries um, or maybe like teams just figured out how to stop him. Just squeeze the sideline. Don't let him get past you. His really only biggest threat is, is getting deep. A lot of times we see NFL teams uh, like adjust after a one year in the NFL. They don't know how to, how to, you know, figure out someone's game. But Darius Slayton is a straight speed guy. He's not the best route runner. So I think they kind of figured out how to, how to stop him for the most part. And he was considered their number two receiver this year. You know, number two corners were lined up on him all, all year long. So I think it's fair to say um, that, you know, he really should be a number three, number four receiver even. I would probably put him in the number three range because I think he can beat those third those third corners, but I don't think he can beat number one, number two corners after this past year. I just don't think that's kind of his specialty. He's a great depth, great number three guy. Um, then passes was directly correlated to six turnovers. Um, he was a complete mess this year. So think about what Dan Jones really had to work with. He had Alfred Morris and Wayne Gallman as his running backs. Um, I don't know. What else? What else? Do you guys have anything else that you can add to this? You'll, you know, drop it in the comment section on YouTube, of course. But 
he didn't have much to work with in terms of actual playmaking talent. So you add Saquon Barkley back. That's a huge one. You add a wide receiver in free agency if you can, whether it's you know Curtis Samuel, Corey Davis, Allen Robinson, anything would help at this point. Literally anybody would help at this point. Um, anybody they sign is going to be better than what we have right now. That That's kind of the reality of the situation. Um, so obviously we would want a guy like Kenny Galladay, a big 50-50 ball getter, Allen Robinson, who's one of the best guys at creating separation in the NFL. Um, and then you have the 11th overall pick that you could look at a guy like Kyle Pitts, a guy like Jalen Waddell, Devonta Smith if he drops. There's so many offensive weapons the Giants could say, you know, let's go that route. Let's sign a guy in free agency. Let's get Saquon back. And now we're looking at a team that has three pr- premier playmakers who Daniel Jones can utilize. And now we can properly evaluate this this team because think think about this. The offensive line was overwhelmed so much this past year. And a lot of, and a lot of the, the reason why is because they were playing cover one. They were doing zero blitzes. They were sending more guys on blitzes because they had no respect for the Giants receivers or running backs. You know, they had no respect that the Giants could beat them in man coverage. They had no respect for the Giants receivers catching footballs out of the backfield. They literally were just manning up across the board and sending any extra player to blitz. The offensive line can only stop so many people. You know, it's a mismatch league. It's double teams. You know, that you can only double team so many people on the offensive line when they're sending seven, eight guys at you, you know, because you were just manning up across the board and getting away with it. So that's that's the the major issue here. Um, the Giants didn't have enough playmakers to open up their scheme. They didn't have enough playmakers to help their offensive line out and help Daniel Jones out. And when the offensive line is, is put in, in peril, it actually forces more fumbles and interceptions for Daniel Jones because he has to make more risky decisions. Okay, you see how this all compounds back to the same thing, the offensive line and the pressure being put on DJ. Um, You add a guy, you add playmakers, and this goes away, right, Anthony? Like, in your opinion, you know, how is that going to help Daniel Jones? How does it correlate back to the offensive line? And really, you know, do playmakers, do you think that with these additional guys, it'll make a significant difference in what we see from Daniel Jones? Do you think people will start to change their opinion after seeing what, you know, he can do with some extra guys? Yeah, I absolutely do think so. You know, I mentioned the Josh Allen, Stephon Diggs thing. I think that that Daniel Jones is set up in a position where if he does get an extra playmaker, like a really dominant one, we could potentially see a breakout like that from Daniel Jones. You know, we've seen the flashes. Um, He was one of the most accurate deep ball passers in the NFL this season. He was constantly hitting on deep balls. Maybe the sample size is a little small. They didn't throw the ball deep that often, but when they did... He was always very accurate, you know, and his decision making needs help, you know, and playmakers aren't going to solve that. That's just going to be him learning year to year and getting better as a young quarterback. But a lot of it as well, like you mentioned, the offensive line is kind of the key, right? The Giants offense is going to go as far as their offensive line lets them and they need to improve the Giants offensive line. Let's hope that they're above average this season, but we hoped for that this past season and they kind of weren't right. Can I add something to that? Um, yeah. So this is just happening right now. The Giants and are going to be looking for a new offensive line coach. This is perfect timing. Um, Dave DeGuglielmo was a, was an interim basis kind of kind of guy. His contract expired at season's end, so apparently they're casting a wide net on replacements. So this is something to keep an eye on. You know, as we as we move forward, the Giants are in the market for a new O line coach, and that will give some con- continuity. You know, this off season they should hire a guy relatively soon. I imagine they will. They can get their guys, you know, in the right shape. You know, get their their fundamentals down, and that'll be really beneficial toward uh, helping them in 2021. There you go. Breaking news as we're discussing the offensive line. Breaking news on the offensive line. So maybe this new coach. That's what we need. Above average offensive line. That's what we're hoping for, right? Because Daniel Jones, you know, a lot of his problems can arguably be, you can argue that they were caused by poor offensive line play, right? Like we mentioned that the offensive scheme might have held him back quite often. Well, the offensive scheme might have been held back by the offensive line, and Jason Garrett might not have trusted his offensive line to have a lot of longly or long developing passing plays, right? Passing plays where the route takes forever to develop and, you know, Maybe he just didn't trust his offensive line to hold up for those, so the Giants just didn't run them that often, right? So better offensive line will lead to better play from Daniel Jones. He'll be upright more often than he, than not, and he'll be standing in a clean pocket and improving his pocket presence. And then, of course, it'll open up the playbook more, which is what getting a wide receiver is going to do anyway. Really, this playbook should open up in, this, in uh, year three for Daniel Jones, but this is really his second year in this scheme right and year two in a scheme is something daniel jones hasn't experienced yet year one he was with pat Shermer. pat Shermer was fired year two new scheme jason garrett i guess a lot of people are hoping to see him get a second year in jason garrett's scheme 
a lot of people are hoping that he doesn't get a second year in Jason, Jason Garrett's scheme, but, you know, let's give it the benefit of the doubt. Having a second year in the scheme could lead to a breakout just because of his comfortability in the scheme, and maybe he'll just be an overall better player, more comfortable running the offense that Jason Garrett has taught him and laid out for him uh, since last year. There's arguments to go both ways. You could make the argument that Sean McVay Definitely. came in to, to the Rams and overhauled their scheme in one offseason, and they ended up having a top, a top offense. So, you know, it goes both ways. You can make the argument that Daniel Jones will benefit from a second season with Jason Garrett. But what I will say in, in you know, just to, you know, give Jason Garrett the benefit of the doubt, like you mentioned, he didn't have much to work with. And when you don't have much to work with, you're forced to, you know, make riskier decisions. You're forced to uh, focus on your first read. You're forced to utilize reserve running backs, new offensive linemen. You had your offensive line coach fired midseason. That's a lot of turnover. There's a lot of stuff to deal with there. So if I'm if I'm Jason Garrett, I'm thinking, okay, let's get some pieces here. He just came from Dallas where they had Amari Cooper, Michael Gallup. They just added C.D. Lamb. He didn't use him. But he had Ezekiel Elliott, Dak Prescott, um, you know, a couple good tight ends. You had a lot more talent to work with. And you go over to the Giants and they basically have a fraction of that. So I do want to give him the benefit of the doubt and say, you know, this is, this is going to be different in 2021. He's going to have more playmakers. He has some resources to utilize. Uh, toward helping his offense and they're going to go out and get him what he wants you know my biggest my biggest concern is is this if they go this route and they and they fit all the personnel to jason garrett's scheme and he decides i'm leaving next year i'm going to go get a head coaching job or whatnot i'm going to leave the giants have to hit the restart button with personnel that might not fit their their next guy's situation so that's my biggest concern but i don't think it's something that we have to take very seriously right now because like, I think 2021, we can at least be a, a, a playoff contending team if we get it right. But it comes down to making the right free agent signings, making the right draft selection, um, and really helping this offense get to where it needs to be. But, Anthony, I think that is the third the, the third factor, is a second year in the scheme will and should help Daniel Jones. There's an argument against it and for it. But at this point, I don't think that there's a ton of different um, offensive coordinators out there. I mean, I like Anthony Lynn. We, we've talked about this before. I think he would actually revolutionize Saquon Barkley for the Giants. I think he would completely make him a better player. Um, and also, he likes to use verticals and really push guys down the field to open up the passing game. So that's kind of what I wish Jan, uh, you know, Jason Garrett would do. But again, the Giants don't have the playmakers to even do that right now. So it, it is it is easy to say, you know, maybe Jason Garrett wanted to do that. He just couldn't do it because his receivers weren't fast enough to get downfield. Sterling Shepard's not fast enough. Uh, Golden Tate's not fast enough. Darius Slayton was obviously hampered. They figured out how to how to bottle him up. If when you go when you don't have guys that can actually do what you want to do. You're forced to improvise, you know, change your playbook, ax entire plays out of the playbook. We saw it happen with Ben McAdoo um, when OBJ got injured. You know, he had to ax the entire slant play out of his playbook. You know, we, we've seen this happen in the past. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens with Jason Garrett specifically. Uh, the reports are indicating that, you know, he's not going to get a head coaching job. The Chargers hired someone else. Um, everyone's kind of going in different directions. The Lions just hired, uh, I think, the special teams coordinator or some coordinator um, that isn't Jason Garrett. So... Tight I don't think coach he got... from the Saints, I believe, is who yes. got the Lions job, which was pretty interesting. That's yeah. a pretty uh, gutsy decision there. It is. It is. It is. So, you know, we'll see what happens with Jason Garrett. I think he's going to stay with the Giants another year. I don't I think, think so they're going to fire him. So, with that being said, the most we can do is just hope they get him some weapons and his and his scheme develops with the talent that he acquires. I also want to give this this one point, uh, just a last little thought, and let me know what you think about this. Due to COVID and due to the lack of a preseason, I really don't think he had the time to adjust his playbook to the talent that he had. You know, he was forcing base concepts um, onto his players for the most part, and he couldn't design plays uh, around what he had. We saw it happen with Evan Ingram a couple times, but I think when with it, with a full off season, um, with a preseason, hopefully, and you know some players in the system for a couple months, they'll be able to design some some specified plays for these guys to to scheme them open and really help maximize their talent. I just don't think they had the actual time to get it done this past off season. Do you think that's that's a reasonable uh, thought? I mean, you know, COVID screwed up everything in 2020. You know, it ruined a lot of things. You know, like, we can all be really grateful that we got football in general. You know, we got football and we got a full NFL season and every game was played. And here we are deep into the playoffs looking at a Super Bowl in a few weeks. But 
and I understand, you know, we have to be sympathetic to a lot of the NFL coaches who did, you know, rookie coaches coming into a new team who had a lot to work with and to struggle with. But at the end of the day, there's teams like the Carolina Panthers. Joe Brady was making a transition from college to the NFL during the COVID and in week one, they dropped over 30 points. You know, like, their offense was pretty decent this year. Like, it was very inconsistent. And granted, they had a lot more playmakers, but I don't always think that you can, you know, like, I, I get that, you know. It, it was definitely hard on Jason Garrett, but at the same time, Jason Garrett's been in the NFL for nearly 20 years, dude. Like, he's been in the league for a long time, you know. He should have been able to adjust to the COVID restrictions in some way and get those base concepts installed a little bit sooner, in my opinion. Like, the fact that he said that they were still on their base concepts through the first, you know, four, five, six weeks of the season, I mean, open it up, dude. Open up the playbook. I think a lot of other teams opened up their playbook a lot sooner, you know, and I understand... I, like, trust me, I get it. There was a lot going on, and I, I get all that. But, you know, I don't know if I would make it an excuse, but I would make it a way of looking at him with a little bit of sympathy and saying, well, maybe in year two it will be better because he doesn't have to deal with this as much as he did in year one. So, but you can't use it as an excuse, in my opinion, because there's a lot of NFL teams that didn't use it as an excuse and found a lot of success this year. But, yeah, there is, you know... There is some sympathy to be handed out to Jason Garrett because that is a really crappy situation. For Joe Judge, too, to step into a new team and have to deal with all of that, it's such an unusual year, such an unusual situation. Um, but, you know, with the offense, I think the offense, you know, if you're just going to say it was COVID-related, I don't know. They, they were the second-worst offense in the NFL this year. There's There had to be more to it than just COVID. You get what I mean? Yeah, that's a very valid point. You know, that's a very valid point that – you would expect the offense to develop rather quickly, you know, halfway through the season during the bye week to show some adjustments being made, and they really just didn't do that. You know, we didn't see anything significant that showed, okay, Jason Garrett has a grasp of what's going on. He's a grasp of his, of his playmakers. My major, my major counter would say would be like, they got Evan Ingram open. They figured out how to get him open. He just dropped the freaking ball. You know, he just created turnovers. If you erase all 11 of Evan Ingram's drops, 11 drops, erase all of them, the five turnovers that he created interceptions and the six uh with the fumble against arizona i think it was if you erase all of those all of those sorry the fumbles against cincinnati erase all of those the giants are in the playoffs that's the difference you know so they figured out how to use their really only pro, uh premier playmaker and they figured out how to get him open he just didn't get it done you know so i do want to make sure that that is that has gotten across but that that's kind of the three factors that we're thinking about for daniel jones's sake in terms of um, him being a breakout candidate for 2021. Obviously, the first one being Saquon coming back, the second one being playmakers being added to the offense, and the third one being a second year in the scheme and understanding the terminology. That's a really big one to, to hit on. The terminology between schemes can be really hard to grasp. Um, so I think he knows the terminology in Jason Garrett's scheme. He's familiar with the concepts. The running game was very, very good. So I will give Jason Garrett credit there. The running game and this concept he drew up were fantastic. I love the running game. The passing game was just a, a, a huge disappointment um, and really led me to believe that he might be, you could justify moving on from him. Um, so I want to see more in that category. We've even floated the idea of a passing game coordinator that would help. So we'll see what they do there, but we want to see more improvements in that category. Um, but to wrap up this video, I do want to do want to give you one offensive line candidate uh, for the Giants and his name, veteran offensive line coach, Jabe, James Kempen. Um, he was with the Chargers last year. The, the new Chargers head coach, Brandon Staley, is bringing in his new offensive line coach. So Campen, you know, he, he's a veteran guy. He's helped develop guys like David Bakhtiari, all pro for Green Bay, left tackle. Corey's Lindsley, um, during his time in Green Bay, he's a center. So he's had his hands on some really, really, really talented offensive linemen. And you always want to bring a veteran in. You, don't, you, you want guys that are proven, especially with young, a young head coach and guys you know, that are trying to uh, get it done with some new offensive linemen um, and new faces. So I think bringing a guy like James Campen could be a good move for the Giants. And you know, that's kind of how I feel about that. But Anthony, do you have anything to add before we, before we sign off? Yeah, I mean, I think that Googe, Dave, Guglielmo, Diamo, yeah, yeah. I think that he did a pretty good job with the offensive line in the second half of the season, you know, stepping into quite a tumultuous uh, area, right? You know, there was a lot going on with that, especially with Mark Colombo, you know, getting his ass whooped by Joe Judge, man, caught 
right hook to the chin. Mark Colombo dropped. I'm just kidding. All of that, I don't believe any of that stuff. But I believe that if it did happen, Joe Judge would have easily won. Because Joe Judge, man, come on, look at him. He's the king, right? But, you know, I think the Giants really need to nail this offensive line coordinator coach position because you can't have such a lack of continuity year to year with the offensive line. The offensive line needs continuity more than anything. It just needs to have consistency, chemistry, and continuity. When you see the Giants fail to pick up stunts and everything, a lot of that is a lack of continuity. The Giants had a brand new left tackle, a brand new left guard, a brand new center, same right guard, brand new right tackle. Zero continuity on that offensive line, plus a new offensive line coach, and then a second new offensive line coach midway through the season. The Giants this year, if we want to see Daniel Jones have this breakout season that we just discussed in this video for over 30 minutes, offensive line has to have some continuity and has to show improvement. That's the number one thing. And I saw somebody say that in the comment section of our last video, the, off the offense isn't going to go as far as the offensive line takes us. I completely agree. We have to see this unit improve if we want to see the Giants actually have their quarterback break out in year three of his career. Absolutely. So this wraps up the Daniel Jones uh, three reasons why he could be a breakout candidate for 2021 video. And before we sign off, I do want to just read one thing I thought was really interesting that I just checked. Um, Drew Brees, you know, obviously we know uh, he had a really, really tough season and really had a, a tough time in the, in the playoffs. And his wife just tweeted out freaking crazy. He played the, most of the season with a torn rot rotator cuff, a torn fascia in his foot, 11 broken ribs and a collapsed lung. That guy is basically Robert Downey Jr. Iron Man style. That is freaking badass. The fact that he able, he's able to play that many games with that much pain tolerance. Unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, yeah, shout out Drew Brees, man. Like, I don't like the Saints personally. I haven't liked them ever since the Bounty Gate scandal. I don't like the Saints at all because of that. I won't even support them until Sean Payton's gone. That's just my opinion. But Drew Brees, I like him. I'll always have uh, respect for Drew Brees. You know, it sucks. It's going to suck to see the Saints not have Drew Brees a quarterback next year. It's going to be very weird. The optics of it are just going to be strange to see. Um, so, you know, shout out Drew Brees, an amazing career. And, you know, I'm, I, I wish he would have, I don't know, because I, I don't like the Saints. But, you know, I wish he didn't go out on such a bad note, you know, because I really do like Drew Brees. And he is a great guy. And he's done a lot for, you know, the city of uh, New Orleans, especially during Hurricane Katrina. So, you know, shout out Drew Brees. He's awesome. I hope he has a great retirement. And man, that's that's incredible stuff right there to play through all those injuries. Um, that's what you want from your quarterback, man, to just put it all on the line week after week. So that's that's awesome stuff. Yep, we saw it with Eli over the, over the years. So as always, yeah. my friends, thank you so much for the support on the YouTube channel, growing like crazy. Uh, make sure to go comment. You know, obviously super active there. And join the Discord. And, and join the Discord. You know, we're posting links obviously to the Discord. It's our private channel where we can have conversation with you guys and really be uh, behind the scenes where all the the Twitter animals will stay away and not come <laughs> after you for your for your opinions. We 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 appreciate everyone's comments and opinions, and we just want to have a good conversation. That's it. Uh, we don't care for any of the BS and the crap that people have to have to have to say um, about differing things. So as always, guys, thank you so much for all the support. We will catch you guys on the next one.